Okay, so next up we have uh, Case Bassa, uh, who is an astronomer and uh, Libre Space uh, Foundation contributor. And we are uh, super happy to have and lucky to have uh, Case with us because it's still day outside. Uh, and if it was night, he would be optically tracking satellites like he does every night. So thank you for joining us, Case. And uh, let's talk about open source satellite tracking. Thank you. Thank you, Pieros. So indeed, I'm a, I'm a radio astronomer by profession, working at uh, ASTRON, the Netherlands Institute for Radio Astronomy. But besides that, I'm also uh, a volunteer for the Libre Space Foundation, operating two ground stations, numbers 39 and uh, 40. But besides that, oh, you can't even see the pointer. Okay, well, we'll do without it. Besides that, I'm also a volunteer at um, the Dwingelo Radio Telescope, which is an old radio telescope that uh, the Institute used to use, but now is used for outreach. And sometimes we actually use that as a SATNOC station. So you get 25 meters of collecting area through a little Raspberry Pi. But during my day job, I use the telescope on the left, which is the LOFAR radio telescope operating at frequencies from 10 to 250 megahertz. But what I'm talking about now is my amateur satellite tracking um, adventures. And so the main reason for tracking satellites is uh, to keep track of orbits and not so much the ones which um, are published by uh, the US military, the, um, which are available at spacetrack.org. Those are the ones that Freddy already uh, mentioned earlier today, but more the ones that um, the US tracks but does not uh, publish the elements for. So those are satellites with uh, national security um, goals. So basically they're spy satellites from either the US or its allies and uh, France, Germany, Israel, and uh, Japan have a few of them up there, and those elements are not published. And so I'm part of a group of about 20 um, amateur satellite trackers around the world that keep track of um, 300 of these classified satellites. And we measure the positions of these satellites and then use those or share those via uh, an old mailing list that you can find at that URL. And one of us, um, every day computes or updates the orbits such that uh, we don't lose track of any of these satellites. Now some of these amateurs have been around since the days of Sputnik and they go outside with binoculars, a stopwatch and then look on star charts where the satellite was when it passed close to a star. I tried that for one evening and got incredibly, well it didn't work. So I decided, okay, this must be possible to do with software. So I started developing some of my own software. And today I'm going to talk about three packages. One is SatTools, which is uh, for, used for optical tracking of um, satellites with video and photographic cameras, where you calibrate the images on the sky, basically the star field to get accurate angles on the sky. And you use uh, the time from the computer to get timestamps. And then you can measure those positions, compare them to predictions, and if they deviate, you can update the orbits. So that's part of, um, of SAT tools. And some of that functionality I'm porting to Python, uh, such that it is a lot more user-friendly and can even operate in a more automatic way. As in, you start it, it'll detect the satellite tracks itself and provide measurements that uh, you then only have to verify instead of measure things by hand. The other um, to, um, repository is STRF, which is SAT tools for radio frequency. That's intended to be able to use Doppler curves to also determine orbits, identify satellites, then determine orbits. And uh, Freddy mentioned this, um, that um, this we're also trying to get implemented in uh, the SATNOX network because uh, there's so much more data available there. So um, for video tracking, the way it works, you have uh, an analog or a digital video camera that points at a particular part of the sky and takes images at a certain frame rate. In this case, it's 25 hertz. And what you can do is use uh, some compression method called maximum temporal pixel that people from the um, Meteor community use that takes n video frames. In my case, I use 250. And for each of those 250 frames, for each pixel, sorry, for each pixel in those 250 frames, it computes the average of those frames and then you just get to see the star field. You can also compute the standard deviation and then you still see some stars but you start to see the tracks of satellites as they passed through the field of view of those 250 images. But the clincher is using the maximum um, 
brightness value of each pixel from that set of 250. You store that in a third frame, and that then gives you where the satellite was in the image. And if you then in a fourth frame store in which of the 250 images that value was maximum, you can keep track of time. So there's two satellites here, and this satellite moved from black to, from left to right, and that one from um, top right to bottom left. So that's how you encode um, time information in these, uh, in these images. So this you do for every 250 frames. So every 10 seconds you get a, an image that is stored as a FITS file that shows the stars. And then you can calibrate those stars against uh, known catalogs to get accurate angles on the sky. And the time information is already stored at the time of the capture of each individual frame. So you now have time and position on the sky. And you can overlay predictions of satellites. And in this case, these, these two satellites are from the space track catalog. And you can see they overlay very nicely, as they should, because uh, those elements are typically very accurate. Then with my software, you can measure a position. And that's actually shown in this top line. Um, you may not be able to read it, but it, it, it encodes time and these angles on the sky, right ascension and declination. And you can measure, because these satellites will probably take um, two or three of these 10 second images to pass through um, the field of view. You can record those positions to use them for orbit de determination later on. I'll skip this one. This is one way to do orbit de determination where you have multiple measurements either from a single location or from other observers. And then you try to determine a two lined element set for that by fitting different orbital parameters. And usually for these objects, we already know what the orbit was, say, five days ago, and we just need to improve it. And then it's just a matter of um, fitting the right parameters to take care of the fact that the satellite is running ahead or running behind in time. And then what you get is a new two-line element set that you can use for predictions for the next uh, five to ten days, depending on whether it's a high orbit or low orbit. And again, because I'm using TLEs, this is done using the simplified uh, um, perturbation models, SDP4 and SDP4. Now, the hardware that I use is um, not too expensive. I started off using analog um, video cameras, the, of which the uh, VATEC 902H2 is the most uh, light sensitive. But that gives you an analog signal, so you still need to use some USB adapter to convert that to digital, and that adds noise, so it's not as clean. And there are small chips there, I think, uh, what is the half inch chip? So with a standard 50, 50 millimeter lens that you use on your um, um, photographic cameras, you get a field of view of seven by five degrees. More recently, um, I and also Piagos have been trying uh, digital CMOS cameras um, used for astrophotography. And they can also operate at uh, quite high frame rates. In this case, I'm using a 10 hertz frame rate. But they have a much larger field of view. The chip is much larger. Um, and in fact, it's so large that you don't even need all the pixels. You can actually bin it down to, instead of using the 16 megapixels that it offers, you can bin it down by a factor of 3 by 3 to 2 megapixels and get a field of view of 18 by 13 um, degrees. And because they're CMOS cameras, the quality is much better. Um, which really helps for detecting faint satellites. So I hope this is visible. Is it visible? What, what you can see here is one image with uh, the, this new camera, this digital CMOS camera. These are predictions from um, the space track and also later on this one is one of the classified satellites as they pass through the field of view. And you can actually see if I go forward and backward that uh, they vary in brightness, so that one's probably spinning a bit. And this one is showing a flare. Ah, why isn't it loading those? Hey, something's wrong. Ah. Is the PDF completely uploaded? Maybe? Shit. Ah. No, not all the f slides are fully uh, uploaded. I need to uh, give uh, Freddy uh, my laptop again. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, you try that, I'll get my laptop. Sorry about that.
Yeah, because we, we are streaming it, so oh, okay. it's possible to... Um, hello. So, uh, is it isn't it uh, tracking uh, restricted satellites illegal? Uh, no. Okay. No. Okay. So it's uh, totally okay to track and uh, access the data that they send. Well, that I don't know. Um, oh. You're talking about radio data, uh, uh, telemetry that they download, that they downlink. Yeah, for download link. Yeah, uh, that that I'm not doing, and I'm not sure if that is uh, legal. Okay. Okay, so for tracking, it's uh, everything okay? Yeah. For just tracking? Just tracking. Okay. Don't Thanks. Don't publish. Okay. So, yeah, here we go. So, you can see that some satellites are uh, variable. And, um, in fact, this one that's uh, an, at the top left corner that you can actually see it uh, flashing and flaring, this is uh, the Microsat ASEO which also happened to go through the field of view of this, uh, of this observation. And uh, it was able, I was able to determine the orbital or the spin period of this satellite, and the people from ASEO were quite interested in that. Because, but the main reason to look at this field of view is for this, uh, this blue track, which is one of the classified satellites that I was targeting with, uh, with this observation. So then, for radio tracking, um, some people have mentioned SDRF already. This is um, not too um, different from SATNOX. You have a software-defined radio and, um, and you channelize the IQ data, but in this case, you don't apply a um, Doppler correction. You just look at the whole waterfall in one go, such that you can recognize all the Doppler curves that may be visible in that spectrum. Um, the important thing here is that the, the spectra are time tagged, such that you can extract Doppler curves and get time and frequency information to reconstruct the orbit. Um, so again, the software that I wrote does that and um, has tools to fit orbits. So I'll show you one plot of uh, the VHF spectrum where you can see, well, certainly these two Doppler curves you can see, and there's one here. There's also a faint one here. But the cool thing is that you can identify these um, log the frequencies um, such that you know that these satellites transmit at those frequencies, so you link the TLE to a transmission frequency, um, and you don't even need to use um, information from the satellite owner for that. You can just measure a Doppler curve, compare it to all the TLEs that are available, and usually there's only one that fits best, and if there's more that fit, that fit well, then you wait for the next orbit, and then you have enough data usually to distinguish between the two. So you can link um, a transmission frequency to a different TLE. Now in this case, um, this 4406 object, that's one of the more recent launches. The one at the bottom right is also a CubeSat, but this 43012 object, which is transmitting at two frequencies, is actually a Chinese rocket, a rocket stage. It, uh, it, it launched a satellite, the satellite is off somewhere, but this rocket stage also has a transmitter on board. We don't know why, but it's transmitting in the UHF band and uh, several people have seen it now and we even track it with uh, the SATNOX network. I'm not sure if we can decode the telemetry, but um, it's out there. Why it's transmitting, nobody knows. Thank you. I'm almost done. This is my 
second to last slide. So this is the same data that uh, Noel Jana showed on Monday for this CubeSat. And with this, you can um, use my program to determine a TLE from scratch. Usually you can do it with about one day of data, but in this case, I think we had 10 days of data and then you get a TLE that is within five kilometers of position from the one uh, that uh, Spacetrack publishes. So it is more than accurate enough to, uh, to keep track of these satellites. So my conclusions, anybody can do this for a quite low budget. I think these cameras and Pierre has showed me his, they go for around, well, maybe up to a thousand euros. And if you want a fancier one, it's maybe 1500 euros. Uh, the lenses are just photographic lenses that you may already own, but you need to have a fast one, so f1.8 or faster. So it's totally feasible to do this, except you need good weather and you need to do this in twilight when the satellites are still sunlit. Um, and with this, you can check for orbital, orbital variability of CubeSats and also observe some of the CubeSats, because even though they're small, if they're at close range and favorable angle, you can still, still see them. Um, for CubeSat itself, the radio tracking is actually more, um, more beneficial because you can get Doppler curves for every orbit. Um, but that's of course only true if the satellite is actually working and the transmitter is active. And as Freddy showed, this, this radio tracking is crucial to figure out which satellite is which when they launch a bunch of them together. And then ultimately, and this is what we're working towards with, uh, or trying to work towards with Satnox, certainly on the radio side, is get these Doppler curves and also optical measurement in a database such that we can determine orbits ourselves and do not rely on, um, on outside resources. So I'll end there. Thank you. Hi, uh, amazing uh, talk. So, um, I wonder how how accurate are the um, are the orbits that you identify from these observations? Yeah. So the um, the radio tracking that's always a bit less accurate than uh, optical because with optical you get angles and uh, that gives you much more information already. So there you can get positions that are good to less than a kilometer, um, and then you actually probably run into the problem that the SGP4 model itself is not accurate enough to model that. I've not tried this, but this is my, my feeling that uh, that may be the limitation. Um, for radio tracking, you just need data, data, data. More Doppler curves, the better. So I'm very interested to see what happens if we can do this with Satnox and you have one pass over Europe where you have 20 stations contributing data. That, that would be, could be a, quite a bit better. What are the smallest objects that you've been able to detect? So this SAO is probably one of the smallest ones that I've seen, and that's, I think, it's not in, it's not in standard CubeSat units, but I think it was 50 by 30 centimeters um, by 30. Um, but it really depends on whether they're stable or whether they're spinning, because if they're spinning, then there's the chance that you get a reflection of one of the surfaces of the sun much higher, and you can, uh, you can see it that way. So I'm just thinking if you were able to do this with the objects that come out over a period of time, you would accumulate data and then you would be able to say something about the concentration of orbits within a certain margin of error. That's certainly possible, yes. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, with uh, optical tracking, can you Oh, the, the Sorry. Oh. Can you know the altitude of the uh, using optical tracking? Um, with, um, well, from a single point, no. But if you have a few points, then you get to know the angular speed. And um, certainly if you assume it's a circular orbit, then you know the orbital altitude. If you think it's uh, eccentric, then it becomes a bit more difficult, but you will certainly know the range of velocities that are possible to give you that angular speed. Thanks. Um, can, can you um, expand a bit on, let's say that we have the observations and we want to end up with an orbital catalog, right? Uh, like what else would that entail? Apart from the observational 
uh, aspect of it. Yeah, so the, the big part right now is that these orbits are determined manually. You use software to fit an orbit to this data. That, of course, is not feasible if you have so much data that uh, you're tracking hundreds of objects. So that needs to be automated in software. And um, I've started a little bit looking into that, but I have nothing definite yet. But certainly for the bulk of the sources of the objects that don't maneuver or have low drag, it should be relatively straightforward. If you don't have large gaps between observations of several days, I think the battery is dying. If you don't have gaps between observations of several days, then it should be, it should be good to, um, to just keep expanding the orbit as you go along. And that would be simple fitting. So the network would help in that. Yeah, yeah, certainly. <coughs> okay. Um, do, do you think IR or thermal tracking would be useful at all with this? You mean infrared? Yeah. Um, I know it's expensive, but yeah, it's even um, ones are well. You yeah. mean if when when the satellite is in darkness? Uh, well, uh, yeah, it would reflect either the sun or radiators. Yeah, it's a good question. It's not something I've thought about. Um, it may be possible. I'm not sure if you can get the same detector sensitivity or the de detector, um, what is it, pixel sizes as you can um, with the optical, but it may certainly be possible. At the front. Uh, So in the images you showed uh, of the photographs, uh, yeah, how do you determine the positions of those stars, with, uh, like in the celestial field? With uh, sorry, can you speak up? Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. So in this uh, in this image, how do you determine the position of the stars in the celestial sphere, like uh, with plate solving? Do how to determine the positions of the star? Yeah, with uh, plate solving. Like to, um, to yes. assign uh, like the right ascension and yeah. inclination. Yeah. So I use open source software that is widely used in astronomy to find the positions of the stars on the image. So that gives me pixel positions, mm -hmm. and then there's even an open source automatic solver called astrometry.net that yeah, you can yeah. just feed an image, yeah, yeah. and it will tell you where on the sky it is located and how pixels match to right. um, angles on the sky. So certainly with these um, digital cameras, that, that works very well. Uh, so you don't even need to do it manually anymore. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Somebody more? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I liked your presentation. Um, wh where are you taking these? Um Where's your camera located? Where, where yeah, it is located? Where in the world, yeah. Um, in the Netherlands, at my home. In the Netherlands. Yeah. So that you have enough clear weather there. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is the limiting factor. Uh, the second limiting factor is my time to analyze all the data. It's very easy to set up a camera and just get gigabytes of data accumulated, but to analyze it takes some time. So that's. The main reason why I started porting it to Python to try to automate as much of the whole process as possible. Um, and that would also make it easier for others to, to set up a camera like this. How much more data would you get, or like how much, how more optimized would your work be if you had a camera, let's say, at Equator? That is? If you had a camera like at Equator. At, at, at the Equator? Yeah. Um, it, um, the northern hemisphere, well, so the northern hemisphere is interesting because we have long summers. So during the summer, um, twilight during which satellites are visible is much longer, which is less so at um, the equator. So that's a bit of a trade off. The problem with the northern hemisphere is at the winter, some sun synchronous orbits are not visible at all. Um, so it's probably more useful to have a station at the southern hemisphere to track, keep track of these objects in the northern hemisphere winter and vice versa. So indeed a network of cameras would be useful and then, well, at different latitudes and also different time zones would help to, to fill in gaps between days even. <coughs> mm. 
No more question? Thank you.